Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carol Musel, and I'm the dean of the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. So this year, our school celebrates its centennial and marks 100 years of nursing excellence. And nursing is not just a career or a discipline, but it's also a global calling. Frances Payne Bolton truly believed in the importance of a worldview. And I think she would be very, very pleased to see that the impact that our students and their school make in the world. Taking a global approach to education has become a co core tenant of our curriculum and our culture. In fact, promoting global health has been a strategic area of focus for us as we strive to support a global health presence, build programs of research and practice across continents, address the health effects of a warming climate, and prioritize health around the world. And this is due to, in large part, the efforts of our Associate Dean for Global Affairs, Dr. Mary Quinn Griffin. Now, before I introduce Mary, I also want to invite all of you, and those of you who might be on Zoom as well, that this afternoon we're also having another interesting centennial-related event, and that is the future of AI in nursing. And this will be held both virtually and in this room. Now, I am pleased to announce Dr. Mary Quinn Griffin, Associate Dean for Global Affairs. Uh, Dr. Quinn Griffin is an international leader in nursing science and education, and she works tirelessly to broaden our horizons, and she will then introduce our speaker. So, Dr. Quinn Griffin. Thank you very much, Dean Musel, for um, that is a um, very nice introduction. I would like to remind everybody that there is a CE offering for this presentation today, and there will be a QR code at the end of the presentation. Um, we will also place the link in the chat for those that are joining us online. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce Dr. Christian Bozo, from Ghana. He has over 19 years of combined experience in nursing education and practice. He earned his BSN degree in 2010 and his master's degree in nursing in 2014, both from the University of Cape Coast in Ghana. Dr. Bozo earned his PhD degree in nursing science from Stellenbach University in Australia in 2019. He is a faculty member at the School of Nursing and Midwifery at the University of Cape Coast, where he teaches in both the undergraduate and the graduate programs. He joined the School of Nursing at Salisbury University here in the USA in August 2022 as a Fulbright Scholar in Residence. And we are very fortunate that as part of his Fulbright experience, he is able to join us here today um, as part of an outreach lectureship um, experience. His research interests include emergency nursing, nursing education, and critical thinking skills in nursing students. So now I would like to introduce Dr. Bozo to you. Dr. Bozo. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm really honored to be here today. I told my mentor, one of my mentors, that I was coming to Case Reserve Western University in Cleveland, Ohio. And what she said was that, wow, that's one of the reputable universities in the United States. And their nursing program is highly respected. And that means you are doing a great job, which is recognized across the United States. But before I begin, I want to thank Dr. Lindell, Dr. Quinn Griffin, Christopher Sipel, 
for playing a leading role in getting me here. And I want to thank the faculty and staff of this school for allowing me to be here and to share my experience regarding our healthcare system and to emphasize two things, mainly the importance of culture and culture diversity and how all of us need to think about globalization and become global citizens, even as we take care of all people across cultures, across borders, and across continents. And I'm hoping that at the end of the day, in review, we'll review our healthcare system in Ghana. We have some similarities. I may not be able to talk about the similarities, but as I speak, we can all compare to the United States, and I've seen some differences. Also look at the culture of Ghana, and then we also look at traditional medicine, which has become one of the important things, even with uh, WHO emphasizing that without traditional medicine, we cannot ensure universal health coverage because a lot of people, whether we like it or not, trust in traditional medicine. And to come to Africa, about 80% of Africans believe and trust in traditional medicine. So I'll try to highlight how Ghana has attempted to integrate traditional medicine into our biomedical healthcare system. And then of course, talk briefly about globalization and how we are working with other universities in the United States to ensure that students who come out of their programs uh, actually have a perspective that is beyond the United States. And you send students and they tell you they have discovered themselves and begin to appreciate even what they have that they thought they took for granted. So where is Ghana? Um, most, usually when you talk about Africa, people think it's a, it's, a, it's a country. But Africa is a continent with so many countries, about 50 countries. And Ghana is somewhere in West Africa. Um, somewhere in West Africa, here. Yeah. Yeah, and we are bordered by Cote d'Ivoire in the west, Togo in the east, and then the northern part is Burkina Faso. And then of course the southern part is the Atlantic Ocean. And um, Ghana is made up of what we call 16 administrative regions. Not either, it's not as big as the United States. So we are made up of about 32 million people so we are very few. United States, I'm told, is about 330 something million people. So that is about a tenth of the United States population. And if you look at the regions, uh, this is where uh, University of Cape Coast is located. Around, it's also at, at the Atlantic Ocean, and that is where I, I live and I work, and that's where my family also work. So um, Ghana is. Um, divided into such um, um, division. But when we talk about our healthcare system, it's a pluralistic one. It is made up of the public sector, the private sector, and even traditional medicine, which is very strong. So Ghana has, as I will talk about later, as I've indicated, I will indicate to you how they also play their role. And then we recognize other sectors um, and to think about social determinant of health and therefore, we recognize that education or the education sector, the agri sector, and interior and all that, we recognize all of those ones as part of um, the healthcare system. Because if they play their role well, we also have patients who will be well. So the Ministry of Health, in, in, in the United States, you see Department of Health and Human Services. Equivalent in my country is Ministry of Health. And Ministry of Health is supposed to be responsible for policy direction, regulatory issues, and to ensure that all these, and of course, usually we will have um, the 
service providers, which I will explain later, the regulatory bodies, and the national health insurance. Now, the regulatory bodies are similar to what you will have here as the nursing board, but this one covers, you have only one that covers the whole country, called Nursing and Midwifery Free Council, like what we have in the UK, or uh, uh, UK, they have Nursing and Midwifery Free Council that oversees the training, um, the education, the regulation of nursing in Ghana. And the regulatory bodies, we have other bodies such as the Food and Drugs Authority, we have the Medical and Dental Council, and um, Pharmaceutical Council, which is also supposed to be one of the regulatory body, bodies that are placed or that are put in place by an act of parliament to ensure that uh, healthcare systems are regulated. Now, when it comes to the service, we usually have from the basic, and that is the approach for which we want to address universal uh, health coverage, where we have what we call the community, the, we have a unit that is in the community. And then from that, then you will have, um, here didn't come out clearly, but we have district hospitals, sub, sub districts, district hospitals, regional hospitals, and then teaching hospitals. And the teaching hospitals are the apex when it comes to referral, um, the referral system. So, so those are the basic level in the community level can refer to the district or health um, centers, and then from the district hospital to the regional hospital, and then to the uh, referral center. So that's the kind of system we have. And then with, with the teaching hospitals, they work directly under Ministry of Health. And we have only about five in the country. We have one in the capital. We have one in Kumasi. We have one in Tamale. We have one in Cape Coast where I work. And then we have one in Ho. So those are the apex when it comes to um, our referral um, um, system. And then the Ghana Health Service, which is here, actually takes care of the healthcare system across the country. So the regional hospital, the district hospital, the sub-district hospital, which sometimes is called the health centers, and then the community uh, units all work under the Ghana Health, um, health Service. And they are to see to it that the right things are done. And beyond that, we have what we call the Christian Health Association of Ghana, CHAC, which is made up of mission, uh, missions. And when I say mission, I'm referring to churches mainly. So we have the Presbyterian Church, we have the Methodist Church, the Catholic Church, the um, Assemblies of God Church, we have um, um, uh, the Baptist Church, having hospitals across the country. And they represent about 70% of our healthcare system. And they are mainly situated in the rural areas where government cannot reach. They are there. And then they play the role of mainly uh, district hospitals and um, sub-district hospitals. And so that is what we have there. Okay. And then we have psychiatric hospitals. Ghana has only um, three psychiatric hospitals. We have one in Cape Coast where I work. We have one in Accra. And then we have one in Pantine. The Pantine and the Accra psychiatric hospitals are both located in the capital. And then we have the um, Ankafo Hospital, which is the, the one in Cape Coast. All of them are located at the southern part. So you can imagine what happens to those who are living in the northern part of Ghana. So we, that, that is really a challenge. And it has been identified as one of the challenges and there is an attempt to make sure that we have uh, institutional representation when it comes to the northern part of our country. So the northern and the middle, but whenever they have clients that will need institutional care, they have to be brought to the southern part, which is really a challenge. Of course, there's an attempt to make uh, mental health a community-based uh, service. So we have community uh, mental health nurses that have been trained, and they are actually trained in, in our university, University of Cape Coast, to ensure that they offer services in the community. But actually, we have some challenges with that. If time permits, we will discuss some of them. And then, as I mentioned, 
the Ghana Health Service is mainly in charge of uh, these facilities that are uh, dotted ac across the country. And so the basic one that we have is the community service. And then we have some district uh, facilities called the health centers. And then we have districts. And then we have regional. And then we have the referral centers. And as I've mentioned, we have um, this one. It didn't represent all of them. This is only three. But we have two more that have been, that have been added. Now, when it comes to universal health coverage, which is the aim of the world, the WHO, we, we all know about the Amata de Declaration, where we talked about health for all by the year 2000, and there were some strategies that were supposed to be placed, uh, put in place by um, all nations to ensure that at least people received basic healthcare services, irrespective of where they were uh, living. Ghana has two approaches when it came to um, universal health care. One of them was is financial protection. And I won't speak much about the financial pr protection, but just for um, your information, it came out as a, um, we, we reflected that in coming out with what we call the national health insurance. So everybody in the country was supposed to have access to national health insurance. So, of course, that meant that we recognize health as a right, not as a privilege. So everybody, but somebody will have to pay for that uh, health care. So there was an attempt to bring out health insurance, uh, national health insurance scheme. There was a tax component of every good or services that you accessed, a 2.5% of value added tax. Everyone, once you buy or access any service in the country, you pay. And then those who were working in the formal sector were supposed to pay about 2.5% of their uh, social security contribution to the national health insurance. So that was supposed to take care of the expenses. And then there was an annual subscription fee that those who, do not, who, who are not in the formal sector were supposed to pay. So when you look at the tax and the monthly contribution from our social security, that accounted for about 95% of the total contribution. Okay, so it's a huge thing. Currently, we have about 16 million people uh, who have subscribed and are active members of the National Health Insurance Scheme. We have our own challenges and mainly from implementation challenges and corruption. The money that is made available is squandered by some other people to have workers contributing and the politicians leading the chat. Sad to say. Now the second strategy is what we call community-based planning and services. Community-based health planning and services. This was based mainly on research. After we have practiced the primary healthcare in our own way for a while, we realized that about seven, more than 70% of the population, especially those in the rural areas, could not get access geographically to healthcare service. And when I say geographical access, in fact, the policy was that eight, up, nobody should travel beyond eight kilometers without accessing health, which is, I think, in uh, five miles, about five miles, roughly five miles. Nobody should travel beyond that distance to assess health. So that is the geographical um, accessibility. But we had a challenge, especially in the rural areas. So there was an attempt to really ensure that everybody, irrespective of where you live, once you require healthcare service, you should be able to get it. So it was a study that was done, a factorial experimental study, which I cannot go into, into details, but there was a new strategy that was introduced. And the strategy was that every 500 person, we demarcated the whole country, that everybody living in a 500 
um, in, in, as 500 population or about 750 household density were supposed to have what we call this CHIPS zone. So they were, uh, so it's community-based health planning services zones. So the country was zoned into these communities. And then there was a special structure that was supposed to be put in place. The structure was supposed to have the, uh, what we call the community health officer who will live there as a resident, okay? And then also have a part of the structure where services will be provided. So the person was supposed to be there 24 hours and to attend to people with emergencies and all that. And when they did that, they realized that service actually increased about eightfold. People were more satisfied. People were ready to come for services because as part of it, they had what is called the community health volunteers. And these community health volunteers were supposed to be in the community, community members, the people knew them, and therefore they were comfortable with them. They were trained to help the, the community health officer to do his or her work. What meant was that they helped in tracing people who perhaps they didn't come for the appointment, um, understood the community better, understood conditions in the uh, community better and were able to help. In fact, in Ghana, if you go to any community and you want to offer healthcare service and you do not carry out good community entry, you will fail. And it's not the political or the formal system that will help you. What will help you is the traditional leaders, community leaders, who may not be recognized by the state, but they are the uh, clan leaders that you have to speak to. And these community health volunteers were people that were endorsed by these community leaders. And once they endorse them, you do not have a problem. You will succeed. And so that is the strategy that they use. There was a community where they established um, a baby, is it, do you, call, you call it, we will call it maternity center. Uh, I don't know, is it baby, uh, how, how do you call it? I think, yes, yeah, something, like, something like that. And in that community, anyone who touched, touched a pregnant woman in terms of delivery must be somebody who will go through a ritual by the traditional leader. In this case, that didn't happen. They just sent uh, mid midwives to those centers and they were expecting the uh, pregnant women to come there for all the services, including delivery. And that was not happening. Now when they inquire, they realized that this was what the situation should have been. So they have to reverse, go back, and then these midwives were taken through the ritual and then the people started actually attending the, the center. So you cannot work in those communities without community involvement. Very, very important and key. And then they have midwives who will help the uh, pregnant women if they need them. So this is an example of a cheap compound. So that is the structure. So you have where the lady is, is where the services are provided. So in, the, in this building, you have a place where you will live with your, uh, the, the one, the community health officer will live, okay, and be able to take care of everybody, yeah. So that, that is the attempt that we did um, in doing that. Currently, we have almost 6,000 uh, uh, chip compounds across the country. Of course, we, have, we still have implementation issues, but that is the way to go in our contest, and it's really working. Anywhere that it has been implemented well, People trust them and they go to them. So they offer services in terms of maternal and reproductive health. So uh, family planning, um, ANC health education, neonatal and child health services, so immunization, expanded um, program of immunization, that's the EPI. Then they have nutritional, nutrition education, and then they do group monitoring in the community. And then if the child has any condition, they also have to treat. And then they manage minor illnesses, such as fever, uh, and they offer 
first aid for cars, burns, and then uh, domestic accidents, and they carry out referrals. And then they also do health education, sanitation, and, and, and counseling on healthy lifestyle and good nutrition. And then they will have to follow up on clients that they are taking care of, and then those who um, do not come for the appointment, they make sure they come to them. In Ghana, we always say uh, those who default, default test, but that's where it's too strong for some of us, so I don't like using it. <laughs> right. Okay, so that, that is actually what the uh, attempt to ensure that we have, um, we are meeting the uh, universal health coverage in our country, and it's really a one that is very helpful. Now, I want to talk about nursing practice in Ghana. Um, again, comparing what happens in the U.S. and, hap uh, and what happens in my country. Uh, like in almost every society or in all society, nurses are the bad bedrock of every healthcare system. And it's the same thing in my country too. And nurses uh, usually have two tracks, um, a, a number of tracks when it comes to trading. We have the registered nurse and then we have the auxiliary nurses. So with the professional or the registered nurses, you either do a diploma program here, I think it will be associate um, degree, but in Ghana it's, it's three years, and we call it diploma. And then um, you do the BSN or the bachelor's program. So for professional nurses and after that, so for um, the diploma is three years and it's taken in what we call nurses training college. And then for the BSN or the bachelor's program is done in the universities. So, and that is four years program. When you, um, in some of the universities, you have to be a science student. So you have to do pure science, natural science, the physics, the chemistry and the biology, and then English, um, mathematics and uh, integrated science. So even if you are a science student, you still have to pass your integrated science, which is more, uh, is broader in terms of scope than the other sciences. And then there are some universities that accept uh, people who have done geography, those, um, as we call them, the arts courses, geography um, and, and, and um, business courses and all that. But in my university, we take those who have done the pure science. We don't take them. And then for the diploma, you can have science and then the arts courses. They are the people who are picked. So you have it as a basic program. And then when you are done, you write your Lancetia, just as it's written in the US here, your NCLEX. But our um, Lancetia exams um, have both written component or the theory component and practical component. In other words, you go to the clinical side and then you perform, there's a checklist to check whether you can really take care of a real human being. And then after that, you can, um, we, if you look at the type of practice we've had over the years, um, we have been very task oriented in our approach, so mechanical in the way we were doing nursing. Now the trend is changing. For some of us, we say the trend is not changing fast enough. So we are seeing more opportunity for the nurse to be more scientific or also to be more critical in the way he approaches things. First, you will see nurses do things because the doctor says I should do it. Now things are changing. And we have programs that are ensuring that that happens. One of them is um, run by Ghana, uh, college of nurses and physicians, uh, nurses and midwives. Now, when you are done with that program, you are considered as a, uh, a nurse specialist. Um, so it's a postgraduate program. It's done th for three years. So we have in pediatric, we have for critical uh, care, we have for emergency, we have for mental health, we have for hematology, those who take care of those with uh, sickle cell is a challenge in Ghana, so it's a very important program. Um, and, and oncology, I mentioned mental health and all that. So, so those people, when they come out of their program, they are independent and they work independently. So they are able to see patients and to make clinical judgment as professionals as to what should be done 
to those patients. So gradually, we are also shifting from the tax-oriented nursing to more um, in, um, critical, more um, nurses who can make judgment for themselves and stand by those judgments. In terms of numbers, we are told we have done well. Somewhere in 2006, the issue of nurses leaving, in, uh, leaving Ghana to the UK and the United States and other advanced country was something that became very alarming. We didn't, we could not actually take care of our people. You go to wards and the place is empty. You have very few nurses. I remember even in 2003 there about, I could go for a morning shift. Our shifts is usually eight hours. It's only the night shift that is 12 hours. So I'll go for morning shift, do eight hours, go home, come back and do another 12 hours because we didn't have nurses and, and the shortage was a very serious issue there. Of course, it was because we had inadequate production, we had excess out migration, and then we have low wages. People were not satisfied with the salaries they were receiving. So there was a strategy to reverse that. And to reverse that, what we did was to expand the training of healthcare professionals. And then there was introduction of ancillary nursing programs. At that time, we had stopped producing. Here you see, uh, is it LPN? We used to have LPN, we called them enrolled nurses. We stopped that program because we thought we should go more professional um, rather than having these ancillary nurses. So there was a reintroduction of that. And it was WHO that pushed that agenda in our country accepted. Uh, nurses protested, but they didn't agree. And then we established um, postgraduate specialist training colleges. As I mentioned, the Ghana College of Nurses and Midwives was established. And then there was a review of the salary up to some appreciable level. It was not bad, but now it has gotten worse again. And then there was introduction of some other incentives such as the uh, star vehicle, uh, high purchase. The government, you could purchase a car and pay it gradually. It's not easy for the average Ghanaian nurse to have a vehicle and, and even the doctors. So that was an attempt to reverse that. So when that was done, we moved from one to thousand um, of the population in terms of nurse uh, population uh, ratio in 2005 to even about 4.6 in 2018. Now it has reduced to about 3.6 um, again. In fact, the problem we had in 2006 is come back. Now we have a lot of nurses living in droves because of the hard economic situation that we have in the country. Um, just recently, UK announced that they were not going to accept nurses from Ghana and some other countries, uh, 50 countries and Ghana was listed. Of course, it didn't mean that they wouldn't accept nurses who want to work in the UK, but what they meant was that they were not going to accept active recruitment of nurses by their employment agencies. In fact, they were not going to accept that. And it was because of uh, nurses are living in Jews because of these kind of challenges that we have. So some of these challenges are listed as high, st the, the standard of living is, is just terrible. The condition of service is terrible, and so people are really living. So of course, and then when it comes to the pull factor, so when it comes to the factor, we have what we call the push, push and pull factors, okay? So the push factors are the conditions in the country that is making people to leave. And then the pull factors are the attractive uh, conditions in these countries that our nurses are moving into to go and work. So the condition of service is better in Western or in, in advanced countries, of course. And then there is that rigorous recruitment of nurses, especially from UK. Now they say they won't do that. Now, I want to quickly talk about culture and healthcare system in Ghana. Of course, we know culture shapes and frames the way people experience, um, uh, the way people take their experience and the world, okay? so. The way I will interpret even health will be very much dependent on my culture, the practices, the values, and the choices that people make. 
um, is considered as a, a, det- a determinant of health. And it affects everything, our families, our nutrition, our religion, the way we look at aging, the way we look at communication, and all that. So it's a very important aspect in terms of health and our well-being. But if you look at Ghana, um, when we talk about Ghana, you may think that the culture is homogeneous. No, it's not homogeneous, it's heterogeneous because we have different ethnic groups. So sometimes the ethnic group will determine some details, though you will find very common things among Ghanaians. And we have the Akans being in a majority, and, and uh, my own tribe is about, it's almost 13%, which is an every um, tribe. Ghanaians generally believe that diseases are caused by physical and spiritual um, circumstances, or in other words, it's both spiritual and physical. And sometimes that affects the choices that they make. Somebody may be diagnosed with a condition, and instead of allowing for the healthcare system to take care of that person, he will go and engage in some other practices uh, without, um, rather than uh, attending to a hospital. So as I said earlier on, because we believe that diseases are caused by physical and spiritual um, means, or the above spiritual and physical, of course the solution too could be physical or spiritual. And so you have in a very traditional system, and again, because of globalization and the exposure to the biomedical system, it's not everybody who will go um, to maybe um, some prayer camp or to a fetish priest if that person is unwell. So it's not, again, um, you may be stereotyping if you think that every Ghanaian is uh, going to go that way. So through divination, incantations, and animal sacrifices, and exorcism, um, or the use of herbs, people actually attend to their illnesses. And if you look down here, you will see some of the uh, things that I use. This is talisman. So sometimes when you fall sick, um, and actually when we send some of the students from Salisbury University, they saw, they saw some individuals wearing that. And it was that the child's neck was, not, was flexible and it was not stiff enough, so they put it there for uh, the correction to happen. And this is like a splint that people use to take care of fractures. So this is used by what we call the bone setters to meet that. And you see them, we visited again one bone setter and the students saw that. And then those who perform rituals like the fetish priests, some incantation to ensure that you are well. And all these ones are also some incantation. You can see some sheep there being sacrificed as a way of appeasing the gods if they think that um, the sickness is as a result of you wronging the gods. Especially if you go to deliver and you have complication, you cannot do spontaneous vaginal delivery, the conclusion is that you have done something mainly against your husband, maybe infidelity, and therefore you have to confess, and sacrifices are made to deal with that. So you have such group of people or people in a country, very traditional, who will go this way. So some of the things that I use, and for those who use herbs, so these are herbs. These are more very traditional ones that are used. So bags of tree, you have leaves, um, even sometimes you have um, flowers and all that are used to treat all sorts of conditions, diabetes, hypertension, and all that. And then, so some of these are some of the leaves. And interestingly, whoever you are, whether you believe in the traditional medicine or not, there is, you will come in association with that. These are plants that I snuff, that are in my compound, in my house, my own house. And some of them, like the noni, is noted to have 
anti-diabetic and anti-hypertensive properties. And in fact, studies have shown that they have that. And then you have dandelion also having such properties. Uh, beta leaves having some Afro aphrodisiac properties and all that. So, and then this one treating malaria, uh, this treating some malaria and that kind of thing. So, you will argue out that some of these plants have these efficacious properties. But there is a challenge that I will talk about later. So again, for, if you go to my country and you drive along the streets, you see all sorts of indications as to what you should come for, some help, doctor who done this, uh, some herbal mistress, and all sorts of solutions. Some are for prayers, you come and we pray for you, and things will be well with you. Um, and some, some, of course, it to be a cessation of the condition that you may have and all that. So you have all these people operating. And the biggest challenge with this is that they are not regulated. And therefore, it's the claims that they make. So whether the claims are true or not, we cannot be sure about that. Okay. But that then raised the issue of the integration I mentioned about 80% of our population trust the traditional medicine. In fact, that would be the first point of call if somebody has any condition before even thinking about going to the hospital. Do you discard what they are doing totally or do you bring them on board? Now what has happened is that, and in fact in some other countries like China, what they've done is that there's a full integration of the traditional medicine into their healthcare system. And from what I read, if you are a health professional going through your training, you also go through traditional medicine. So that the doctor, the nurse, the pharmacist, all those professionals also go through. So that is a full integration. So that when you went to the hospital and you preferred Maybe you were diagnosed as having diabetes and you, were, you preferred using traditional medicine. That doctor will prescribe it for you. Okay, so that is full integration. And then we have had, and in, 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 in our case, a parallel system where we have a unit in the hospital, in some of the hospitals that handle traditional medicine. And again, some of the students we sent there saw that happening. And these individuals are called traditional medicine practitioners. They go through the normal university training. So they are training uh, one of our university, KNUST, University of Science and Technology, Kwame Nkuma University of Science and Technology. So they do the anatomy and physiology, they do the pharmacology, they do all the courses that a, um, a health professional will have to go through. And then when they are done, they are, also, they are certified. And so they work in the health facilities to provide that. So you will see that integrating it should be the approach. And so you can see here that this is a herbal preparation, but it's packaged well. So these ones have gone through the scientific method. So we looked at the efficacies. We've looked, we know the side effect. We can tell of the dosage that needs to be used. The other ones, there's no dosage. They'll just tell you, um, get these herbs, put it on fire, boil it, you get the extract, and then you start taking it. Take one glass, whether you can't tell the concentration, and then you just take it like that, okay. But these, one, these ones, they have gone through the training and they, they understand the implication of medication some say, oh, half of herbal preparations, they are not dangerous. They don't have any side effect. And we know that is not true. They are made of chemicals. And therefore, if they are chemicals, then we need to handle them and handle them well. In fact, there have been reports of people having kidney failures because of some of these medications that they are taking. Some of them are very toxic to the body, and people are not aware. So we... we we, we used to consider them to be primi uh, uh, primitive, 
But as I said, we now place them in pharmaceuticals. Therapeutic effects have been established through the scientific investigation. We have a whole scientific institution in Ghana that anyone who has herbal preparations and making claims must go. They sometimes fear that if they send their preparation there, the intellectual property thing, who owns the property and all that, they think they'll steal their knowledge and the rest. And the way some of them claim they discover that, they discover these medications that can treat, is that they dreamt and they had a dream um, um, some ancestor was revealing to him this help can treat this medication and all that. I think for us, we are in the physical for now, so we can talk about physical things. So if you think that it is efficacious, you just bring it and let it go through the scientific method. And some of them are not willing to do that. So actually, the traditional medicine holds so much promise because, of course, even some of the medications we are using in the hospitals today, like quinine, came from herbs, artisanate, amodaraquine, we used to treat malaria, comes from herbs. So all that we need to do is to regulate it, regulate the practitioners, regulate the, the practice itself, and then regulate the preparation of it. Allow it to go through the scientific method. Let's invest there. Let's invest in the, in the personnel. And we'll have the best. And if people trust it, they will use it. And that will go to our um, advantage. In any case, a lot of people are looking for jobs, and they can't get jobs. And if you look at the ratio of traditional medicine practitioners to the population, it's about 1 is 200. So people will go to them because they are easily accessible. Now, the challenges I've mentioned some already, the poor control of it, um, and then everything is shrouded in secrecy. Um, when we visited the, one of the herbalists, we asked how is he able to diagnose and to come out with the treatment that he claims is able to help his client. He says that he, he can come out with a diagnosis when he takes in some alcohol and becomes drunk. Then it will dawn on him how it comes to him or not, I don't know. So he's able to get it through that. So it's everything is shrouded in secrecy. And if you ask them, that's what they will say. They will not be ready to um, tell you. So reports and documentation on the adverse effect is scanty or non-existent. So usually, they don't even know the side effect. You can't tell you how it works and all that. Yeah. So that is about the traditional medicine. So we decided, again, on the area of ensuring that all of us become global citizens. Again, as we talk about our traditional healthcare system, we talk about our culture and the way we approach healthcare. We talk about having physical and spiritual approach to the care. We send some students to Ghana in January from Salisbury University to go and experience the healthcare system. So they had the opportunity to go through our biomedical healthcare system. And then they also had the opportunity to visit the traditional medicine practitioners. So with the traditional medicine practice, they visited two main, we didn't have time, so we, have to, we visited, it was only two weeks that they were supposed to immerse themselves into the culture and to learn as much as possible. So they visited some um, faith healers, and for the faith healer, all that he used is based on the Christian faith. So whenever you are not well, you have mental issues, you have diabetes and whatever, you go and then they use prayers to attend to you. And so that is what they use. But what good thing that was done uh, was that even though it was not formal, the healthcare facility, the health center there, the one who was manning there had developed a relationship with them so that if you say you can pray for somebody to be cured of his mental illness, when you are done, can you refer the person to me too? So they work together, he should visit there, and then they will also apply the biomedical system to them. And for that, that was working. 
And, and so, but of, uh, I don't know whether it's an unfortunate or fortunate thing. At the end of the day, he will say that it was the prayers that worked. Okay? So, that kind of thing. But if you insist, the people trust them. They won't go to the hospitals. They won't visit the health facilities. So, there's some level of tolerance that is uh, done there. So, um, they learn a lot in going there. But also, I have my own family here. And we are thinking about globalization. And the Fulbright program encourages uh, cultural enrichment. Immerse yourself in them. So my own uh, family is here, my wife and two kids. So this picture you see there, we had visited the, uh, the National Zoolo uh, Zoological uh, Park in Washington. And then we took that picture. And we have experienced so much. So. Um, Again, some of the students here, um, if you look at the picture here, I mentioned the community volunteer. So this is a volunteer. He's not actually a health professional. But the community that we visited and did community service, and, and the student had opportunity to visit clients, give immunization, give health education on so many topics and all that. If you do not see this man, we could not enter and become successful. So that is the idea of involving the community. So he is the one who will lead you to the areas and the clients you should be attending to. And once they see him, they are relaxed, okay? And then we have some of our healthcare professionals. Uh, this is a nurse. A diploma nurse, he's dressing, uh, we wear green. And then this is a community health nurse in, the com uh, in that healthcare facility that we visited. Um, when we visited one of the herbalists, these are some of the things, this is not in the one I showed in my picture. Uh, personally, I don't use it, uh, but people come for it to go and use. And whether it works for them or not, I can't tell. Okay, so some of the things they were using, we visited them and that is where they explained to us what they were doing. And then there's one of the, the students giving immunization to a child who didn't keep the appointment. So when you go there and visit and you see the child, you, end, you uh, speak with the mother and if um, they didn't come, you look at it. Every, every child had a card. It's not elect an electronic system as we have here. So they will write it on it, so you can you take it and check, and it will tell you whether the child has visited the hospital or not. And then the immunization is given. So this is one of the chief's compound that uh, we visited, and that is where the students were deployed to go into the community. So this is also another student who was in one of our hospitals, the regional hospitals um, in Eniku, to take care of. And these students, we are running an inter-professional program uh, at Salisbury University. So this course was uh, inter-professional program. So he's a respiratory student. So he also had that experience and all that. So this is also another health facilities that we, we visited. Okay. So again, um, we too, whilst we are in, in the United States, we had the opportunity to immerse ourselves in the culture, and that is the last thing I will speak about. And this myself, in, during the Easter, uh, they said egg hunt, Easter egg hunt. And some, the church that I was attending also had some um, goodies for anyone who came around. So I was serving there. My wife, this is my wife also serving. And this is my boy, also trying to be part of the occasion. Um, and, and then there was also one um, volunteer, um, one charity organization that offered beds for people who are homeless. I also went there, and then they gave them lunch, supper, breakfast, and everything. So I was there also to go and serve. And I had opportunity to do some presentations and visit some schools as my clinical uh, supervision and the rest. So this is my boy also, this is my girl also 
or enjoying the United States environment. So in a nutshell, all of us must take the opportunity to see how best we can immerse ourselves in other cultures and experience those cultures. When I, I've been here and you ask some people, they've not even traveled beyond their own states. So somebody's in Maryland, say, I've not gone beyond Maryland. All of us must travel around. I wish I had opportunity to travel uh, around the world more than I've done now. But that helps you to become a better person. And as I said earlier, one of the students in reflecting on what he or she has learned made a point that I have now discovered myself. I didn't know that I was that resilient to overcome some of the challenges that we have here. Now I appreciate what I have in the United States. And so all of us, as we get the opportunity to know other people, it makes us a better person. We begin to have different perspective towards life and we are able to become global citizens. Thank you very much for listening. much, Dr. Bozo, for a very enlightening presentation. Um, we um, are really um, about out of time, and Dr. Bozo will be in, uh, joining us for lunch, so I think we can reserve our questions um, uh, until then, unless there is somebody who has a very pressing question. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Bozo for his presentation today. I would also like to thank Dean Musil and the faculty and staff of the School of Nursing, um, along with especially Dr. Lindell, um, Maureen Kendall, um, Dr. Uh, Sippel from the International Office, and all of those who have helped in any way to make this presentation today possible. Um, you'll see here we have the um, QR code for the continuing uh, education credits. So go right ahead and um, take it, and then um, you will get the certificate. Thank you very much.